Nigel Farage. In generations to come, children will be told a story. They'll be told that once upon a time, Europe was divided. There was a big wall down the middle of it, and the people in the East were very poor and they had no democracy, and they lived under an evil system called communism that killed millions of its own people. But joy of joys, the wall came down, and we finished up with 27 nations, and those people lived in democracy, and 500 million people lived in peace. But sadly, 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 no, there is more. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you there's more. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I should just sit down now. Well, I must say, that's the first time, that's the first time I've ever received such applause, and I'm tempted, Mr. <laughs> Verhofstadt, I am tempted to sit down, but if I may, sadly, the story continues, the politicians in charge became very greedy and they wanted money for themselves, and they wanted power. And so they resorted to lies and deceit. And they staged the most spectacular bureaucratic coup d'etat that the world had ever seen. But they didn't need to use any bullets to do it. They were much cleverer, much more scheming than that. No, what they did is they put in place a new treaty. It was called the Lisbon Treaty. And then, and then they gave 27 people total unlimited power. These would have been the people, these would have been the people that made all the laws. Of course they already had a flag and they already had an anthem but they went about building a new state but they ignored the people and what they did, whether they knew it or not, is they recreated the very evil system that the people in Eastern Europe had lived under before but the incredible thing was, the incredible thing was that many of the new bosses had also worked for that same evil system before. And the defining moment for me in this house was we had the French say no, we had the Dutch say no, and then we had the Irish say no, and this parliament has willfully carried on ignoring the wishes of the people. You just don't get it, do you? No means no. And it's truly, it's truly incredible that 499 members of this House voted to ignore the Irish no vote and to continue with the treaty. What kind of a parliament is this? If you believed in democracy, you would not just bulldoze aside those three referendum results. Well, good morning, everybody. You're all very downbeat this morning. I thought this was going to be a big, proud moment. I mean, it's taken you eight and a half years of bullying, of lying, of ignoring democratic referendums. Eight and a half years it's taken you to get this treaty through, and on the 1st of December, you will have it. And, of course, the architect of all of this, Giscard, wanted from this constitutional treaty for the European Union to have a big, global voice. But I'm afraid the leaders have suffered from a collective loss of nerve. They've decided that they want their faces to be up on the global stage, not somebody from the European Union, and so we've got appointed a couple of political pygmies. The Kissinger question of who to call in Europe hasn't really been answered, has it? I guess the answer can only be Mr Barroso, because he's the only one that anybody in the world has ever heard of, and is probably the big winner out of these posts. No wonder, sir, you look so happy this morning. <laughs> and we have a new President of Europe, Herman Van Rompuy. Doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, does it? Um, I can't see him stopping the traffic in Beijing or Washington. I doubt anybody in Brussels would even recognise who he is. And yet, he's going to be paid a salary that is bigger than Obama's which tells you all you need to know about this European political class and how they look after themselves. But at least he's an elected politician, unlike Baroness Cathy Ashton, who really is the true representation of the modern-day political class. In some ways, she's ideal, isn't she? She's never had a proper job, and she's never been elected to anything in her life. So I guess she's perfect.
for this European Union. Excuse me, Mr. Farage. Yes. I would like to put down your, your, your postages. You, you made your, your presentation. Right, okay. is yes, enough for us. Down, okay. Down, Please continue. Calm down. But, I mean, she's never been elected to anything, and no one knows who she is. Even the Prime Minister was talking about Baroness Ashdown as opposed to Ashton. I mean, no one has ever heard of her. She's even less well known than Herman Van Rompuy. I mean, that takes some doing, doesn't it? She's risen without trace. She's part of this post-democratic age. She married well. She married an advisor and a friend and supporter of Tony Blair and got put in the House of Lords. When she was in the House of Lords, she was given one big job. And the job was to get the Lisbon Treaty through the House of Lords and to do so pretending, pretending that it was entirely different to the EU constitution. So she's good at keeping a straight face. And she vigorously crushed any attempt in the House of Lords for the British people to have a referendum. So here she is. Never stood for public office, never had a proper job, and here she gets one of the top jobs in the Union. Her appointment is an embarrassment for Britain. But it's much worse. Well, at least I've been elected, sir. Unlike her, she's not been elected, and the people don't have the power to remove her. But just hear the next bit. There's something rather more serious than that. Cathy Ashton was an active member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. In fact, she was the treasurer of the campaign for nuclear disarmament during a period of time when CND took very large donations and refused to reveal the source. What is known is that these donations were obtained by a man called Will Howard who was a member of the Communist Party in Great Britain. Will Baroness Ashton deny that while she was treasurer that she took funds from organisations who were opposed to Western-style capitalism and democracy? That question must be asked. And are we really happy that somebody who will be in charge of our overseas security policy was an activist a few years ago in an outfit like CND? I mean, if we really think that, frankly, we need our bumps felt. I don't think that she's a fit and proper person to do this job. She has no experience, and unless she can answer those questions, did she take money from enemies of the West? That question must be answered. Well, we have our two pygmies. We'll have the bland leading the bland, but I'm not celebrating because they'll press on with political union, and whilst our leaders may have saved face for the moment for themselves on the international stage, they have all betrayed their national democracies. The European state is here. We're about to get an avalanche of new laws because of this Lisbon Treaty and there's no question in my mind that there has to be a full, free, fair referendum in the United Kingdom to decide whether we stay part of this union or not. I hope and pray that we vote to leave, but either way, the people simply must be asked. Thank you. Well, um, uh, chciałem, chciałem, I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Farage. It would be most uh, appropriate if you turned your uh, tone down because certain expressions uh, are not acceptable to everybody. I would like to ask you whether you would like to accept a question uh, uh, from uh, some of the members as the blue card question. Uh, Madam I'm just, I'm just uh, Herzog, I'm just curious. Please. What is yeah. Well, uh, well, maybe, maybe. Well, as well, uh, Madam Herzog, please. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Farage has said that those people they were elected last week are not those the traffic will stop to let them go. And this is why we elected them, because we wanted to elect people who will make the traffic move for all European citizens to get a better life to themselves. And this is what they will do. Mr. Rompuy and Mr. Cathy Ashton are four people and the 480 million people European will know it soon. I think this is the stake and we have to stand for them. We have to stay, stay, save their integrity, personal integrity. And Mr. Farage, I'd like to say something 
Hungarian quotation for you. It's good that you are here because if the monkey goes up to the tree, it's better seen how red is his popo. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, with respect, I think you've completely missed the point. Because twice you said the people that were elected last week. They have not been elected. That is the point that I'm making. And in the case of Baroness Ashton, she has never been elected to public office in her entire life. She takes an enormously powerful job, and the peoples of Europe, of Britain, of everywhere else, do not have the power to hold her to account and to remove her. And that, fundamentally, is what is wrong with this whole European Union. It's all about bureaucracy versus democracy. Things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. But, Mr. President, can I please come back and ask you the question? You seem to imply that I'd said something that was inappropriate or over the top or wrong. Could you please explain what that was? I want to know. Um, uh, some uh, uh, way of explanation of the way of uh, selection of the so important people for the European Union and uh, uh, what you say about the whole issue which is connected with that. It is just, by my opinion, uh, absolutely improper to the whole situation. Well, it is my opinion, colleague, okay, fine. When you were, when you were elected, yes. as, when you were elected as president, you said you would act as a neutral president to ensure that all sides of the debate were given their chance to have a say. If you're criticising me on the political content of what I say, then you're not doing your job as a neutral chairman. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you lot. And uh, what mechanism Mr. do President, the peoples of Europe have Mr. to remove President. you? Is this European democracy? Well, I, I sense, uh, I sense well, though, that you're competent and capable and dangerous. And I have no doubt that it's your intention to be the quiet assassin of European democracy and of the European nation states. You appear to have a loathing for the very concept of the existence of nation states. Perhaps that's because you come from Belgium, which of course is pretty much a non-country. But since you took over, we've seen Greece reduced to nothing more than a protectorate. Sir, you have no legitimacy in this job at all, and I can say with confidence that I can speak on behalf of the majority of the British people in saying we don't know you, we don't want you, and the sooner you're put out to grass, the better. Tout ce qu'on propose comme objectif ne sont pas toujours des objectifs soft. Ça pourrait être, figurez-vous, des objectifs hard. Et là viendra le moment difficile. Il y a, il y a la demande de, des réformes et il y a l'exécution des réformes. On exige sur le plan européen des mesures dures, des grandes réformes, des réformes hard. Et quand on entre dans son pays, je vois peu de résultats de tout cela. La méthode ne résout pas tout. La méthode sans engagement politique, sans commitment, ne vaut rien du tout. Pour la stratégie économique, je veux bien que certains disent qu'il faut plus de contraignances. Oui, je veux bien, mais le traité de Lisbonne, pour les Economic Guidelines, ne le prévoit pas. Je n'ai pas fait moi-même le traité de Lisbonne, d'autres l'ont fait, mais il ne prévoit pas des sanctions, des pénalités, des mesures négatives quand il s'agit de l'implémentation des Economic Guidelines. Regardez de tout près l'article 121 pour vous en être, pour être tout à fait. 
we are in the presence of a great man today, the President of Europe, a man who is so important, he is beyond criticism, beyond reproach, he is the king of the modern political class, he is the modern day Zeus, and he intends to rule us from Mount Berlimont, and woe betide anybody that questions his authority, or questions his dignity, or they will face severe punishment. Indeed, in my case, uh, the last time we met, um, and I had one or two things to say, uh, the Parliament imposed the maximum possible fine. And I'm told that if I say anything that upsets you, the microphone will be cut off. Well, what price free speech? What price democracy? But you've come back to us today, and now with the approval of Mr Sarkozy and Angela Merkel, you're the head of a new economic government for 500 million people. And you've launched your 10-year plan, your wish list, and I just wonder, have you remembered what happened to the last 10-year plan that was launched in 2000? It was, it was launched in this parliament to much acclaim. It was a total and utter crippling failure even before the global recession hit. And in fact, all centralised EU plans fail. Just look at the disastrous, ruinous common fisheries policy. And now your beloved euro has failed. It's failed politically at its first major hurdle. You weren't able to come up with a plan at that summit. You can't bail out Greece without the International Monetary Fund coming in to save, at least for the moment, your euro dream. And yet, Mr Van Rompuy, your plan seems to be we're, we're losing, we're failing, let's have more of the same. Let's have more Europe, let's have more failure. But what really matters is the loss of democracy here. You have not been elected. You are not accountable. There is no mechanism for the peoples of Europe to remove you. It was Zeus, of course, that kidnapped Europa. My fear is you are kidnapping our democracy. You are only here because that Lisbon Treaty went through without the British people being given the referendum that they were promised. And as far as we're concerned, this is unfinished business. People fought and died so that we could be an independent, self-governing, democratic nation that was able to hire and fire its leaders, and no one that believes in democracy will accept the post of President of the European Union. You want to get rid of the British rebate, which will mean by 2013 our contribution will be £13 billion. It will have quadrupled in the space of six years. And simply, the taxpayers of Britain, realising all of this, seeing your direct tax, will conclude that we simply can't afford the European Union. But I do see a ray of hope. The Deauville deal between Merkel and Sarkozy, the thing that you're all so terrified of today, I hope it happens. Let's have a new treaty. You yourself seem to be almost supporting it. Let's have a new European treaty and let's put it to a referendum in lots of countries, particularly in Britain, and the British people will conclude that this is a very bad deal for Britain. They'll vote for us to leave the European Union and begin the unravelling. Thank you. Well, we're happy to go. Thank you. Mr. Uh, call President Nigel Farage. Freedom and democracy. Well, good morning, Mr. Van Rompuy. You've been in office for one year, and in that time, the whole edifice is beginning to crumble. Uh, there's chaos. Uh, the money's running out. I should thank you. You should perhaps be the pin-up boy of the Eurosceptic movement. But just look around this chamber this morning. Just look at these faces. Look at the fear. Look at the anger. Poor old Barroso here looks like he's seen a ghost. You know, they're beginning to understand that the game is up. And yet, in their desperation to preserve their dream, they want to remove any remaining traces of democracy from the system. And it's pretty clear that none of you have learned anything. You know, when you yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability, I suppose I could applaud you for having a sense of humour, but isn't this really just the bunker mentality? You know, your fanaticism is out in the open. You talked about the fact that it was a lie to believe that the nation state could exist in a 21st century globalised world. Well, that may be true in the case of Belgium, who haven't had a government for six months, but for the rest of us, right across every member state in this union, and perhaps this is why we see the fear in the faces, increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class, we want the whole thing consigned 
to the dustbin of history. And we had the Greek tragedy earlier on this year and now we have the situation in Ireland. Now I know that the stupidity and greed of Irish politicians has a lot to do with this. They should never ever have joined the Euro. They suffered with low interest rates, a false boom and a massive bust. But look at your response to them. What they are being told as their government is collapsing is that it would be inappropriate for them to have a general election. In fact, Commissioner Wren here said they had to agree their budget first before they'd be allowed to have a general election. Just who the hell do you think you people are? You are very, very dangerous people indeed. Your obsession with creating this Euro state means that you're happy to destroy democracy. You appear to be happy for millions and millions of people to be unemployed and to be poor. Untold millions must suffer so that your Euro dream can continue. Well, it won't work because it's Portugal next with their debt levels of 325% of GDP. They're the next ones on the list. And after that, I suspect it will be Spain. And the bailout for Spain would be seven times the size of Ireland. And at that moment, all of the bailout money has gone. There won't be any more. But it's even more serious than economics, because if you rob people of their identity, if you rob them of their democracy, then all they are left with is nationalism and violence. I can only hope and pray that the Euro project is destroyed by the markets before that really happens. Now, Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you. 2010 will be remembered as the year when the flaws, the deep flaws in the Euro project were exposed and when the public in Europe woke up to the sheer stupidity of their leaders. And so here we have another summit, another crisis, confidence in the euro ebbing by the week. It's like watching a slow motion car crash. And now you want a permanent bailout mechanism. You think that if you have a fund of say a billion euros, all will be well. Well it won't be well. The failure of the euro is nothing to do with speculation. It's nothing to do with the markets, be they currency or bonds. It's because the North and the South in Europe cannot today or at any point be put together in a single monetary union. It won't work. And politically, of course, you have to change the treaty. The reason being that the four German professors will win at Karlsruhe um, and prove that the bailouts you put in place already were in fact illegal under the treaties. Well, in many ways, I welcome this treaty change because it will mean that there has to be a referendum in Ireland. And you never know. David Cameron might even keep his promise and hold a referendum in the United Kingdom. And I'm sure as Democrats you would all welcome a referendum on the EU in the United Kingdom. We should also reflect, we should also reflect at the end of 2010, not just on the state of the Union, but on the state of Belgium. For six months, the Belgian presidency in office have sat here telling us we must integrate more deeply. What a farce this is. You haven't had a government in your own country since June. Here we have a non-nation trying to abolish our nation. It truly is an absolute farce, but nobody here dares to admit it because you're all in denial. Belgium is a microcosm from the entire European Union. Belgium is about to fall to bits and the rest will follow. Happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs>